Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. Welcome to episode 18. I'm joined by Sue Kelly, President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Public Power Association, or APPA, in her office in Washington, D.C. Our past 17 episodes have presented CEOs across a wide spectrum of company settings, including publicly traded, privately held, and not-for-profits. This episode 18 presents a CEO's leadership over a unique type of organization, the Industry Association. Industry associations play many complex roles for their membership, including as advocate for an industry's position on political, legislative, and regulatory issues, as information source on current and emerging issues from an informed, frontline position, as promoter of the industry, its people, and their accomplishments, and as educator for the professionalism of its membership. I'll be right back to introduce Sue Kelly. President and CEO of the American Public Power Association. I'm delighted to be here today in Washington, D.C., hosted by my guest on our program, Sue Kelly, President and CEO of the American Public Power Association. Thank you for hosting me and joining me today, Sue. It's my pleasure. The American Public Power Association serves its membership, which is comprised of about 1,400 public power utilities spread across 49 states, excluding Hawaii and including the territories of American Samoa, Guam, Northern Mariana, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. A word on public power utilities. Like public schools and libraries, public power utilities are owned by the community and run as a division of local government. Governance is typically provided by a local city council or an elected or appointed board. Sue Kelly has served as APPA CEO since 2014. By way of historical context, associations have historically been inextricably linked to democracy in the United States. Fifty years after America's founding, a Frenchman named Alexis de Tocqueville observed America's democracy and wrote a book which to this day remains an accurate and insightful commentary about democracy in America, aptly titled Democracy in America. In his day, democracy was still something of a novelty. Other countries had tried various forms and components of democratic government. De Tocqueville observed that the strength of the U.S. democracy lay in the free association of its citizenry. The day-to-day local involvement of Americans with people who share common interests in running schools, helping neighbors, joining organizations, he said that free association combats the natural ailments of democracy, including selfishness and apathy. And he was talking about how America is just a bunch of joiners, an association for everything. And he's right. You know, we do have an association for everything. And D.C. is kind of association central. Associations are a vital part of the Washington area economy. We perform a very valuable function of representing our memberships, whatever they might be. What we all do is, in effect, translate inside the Beltway to outside the Beltway and vice versa. We bring the concerns of our members from across the country, whatever it might be, from whatever industry or line of business that they're in, and then translate that to what's needed in Congress and at the agencies and, you know, to just tell our story and talk about what we need from the federal government in order to make things work. That's kind of the classic role of an association. But I almost see myself, at least in the case of our association, as the mayor of public power. We are all communities across the country. As you noted, we have about 1,400 members in 49 states. We range in size from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to small towns with 500 meters in very rural areas. We all share common concerns, but there's a lot of differences too. They're each a community, but APPA is the community of communities. And in addition to representing them in Washington, I see one of our biggest services and functions is to help them work with each other and learn from each other. It's almost like we're a learning community, especially 
given the time of change that we're in in our industry, where we're having to adapt new technologies, new ways of thinking. But what we want to do is act as a platform for our members to learn from each other. One of our big functions is to, to we have a whole series of conferences, meetings, listservs, webinars, you name it, educational content and community building content where people can ask each other questions and learn from each other. What was your interest in associations in the first place? You had a law firm background. Were you serving associations? I, associations were our clients okay. at my firm. Uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association mm-hmm. was a client of the firm. The American Public Gas Association was a client of my law firm. So I enjoyed representing them when I was in private practice because I got to do the policy work. Mm-hmm. A lot of energy law at that time was litigation, where you'd be doing cases in front of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or in the appellate courts. There was a lot of discovery, a lot of writing testimony, cross-examination. It was important for that specific client in that specific case, but a chance to work on the rulemakings and the policy was more, to me, fulfilling and interesting because it wasn't just a specific dispute. It was the larger picture of how are we going to do things and how is our policy going to be set. So I liked working for associations because I could get involved in the policy realm. What were some of the big policy areas that were... Well, for me, I started out actually doing natural gas regulatory work. I was working with natural gas municipal distribution entities. Our client was the American Public Gas Association. I was around for Order 436 and Order 636, which this is old stuff now, but that's when they did open access on natural gas pipelines back in the 80s. Then in the 90s, I went to NRECA as in-house counsel. NRECA is the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Three days after I got there, they issued the notice of proposed rulemaking that led to order number 888. It was kind of doing on the electric side what had already been done on the gas side with open access. Well, I got to participate in all these kind of mega policy dockets and cut my teeth in the electric industry on those open access issues and learning the open access tariff. And so I really got a chance to get in on the ground floor of that change in the industry. It was a really interesting experience. You can see how well-intended policies can have unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our guest, Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. We're back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. We're discussing the phenomenon of well-intended policies having unintended consequences. What has APPA had to do to change the unintended consequences of well-intended policy? We've had to join together, really enhance the role of entities like joint action agencies and the energy authority. And therein lies one of the values of APPA, the joint action agency. Years ago, we helped form them, you know, a long time ago. Actually, this book I'm holding here, which, of course, you can't see on a podcast, but it's called Public Power, Private Life. And it is the autobiography of Alex Radin, who was our longtime CEO and worked with eight different presidents, guided the association through many, many trials and tribulations. And one of the things that he worked on was helping back in the 50s and 60s and 70s help form these joint action agencies so that each individual municipal natural gas distribution company was not out there alone, that they had an entity to represent their interest in wholesale markets. Mm -hmm. That is one thing we do well is joint action. It's not only the joint action agencies, but we also have state associations. You'll have the Ohio Municipal Electric Association or the Tennessee Valley Public Power Association, and they work together on issues of state and regional interest, and we work with them on issues of national interest. So we've got a kind of a whole public power ecosystem of organizations that work together to try to address these issues. What's old is new again. It absolutely is. When I became the CEO in 2014, I was given this book when I arrived in 2004 as a general counsel, and I said, yeah, 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 and I read it. And, you oh, know, you did read it? Okay. I, I read it then, but it just didn't mean that much to me. Ten years later, when I became the CEO, I read it again, and it meant a lot to me. Unfortunately, it was around that time Alex Raiden passed away. At my first national conference, which was in June of 2014, he had just died. So I thought, you know, this is really what the national conference speech is about, is a tribute to him 
and all he did for public power. What just struck me when I read the book is how these were all the same issues. They may have different manifestations or different characters, but it's the same issues. My national conference speech started out with a video tribute to Alex Braden, and then I talked about, you know, these are all the things Alex told us in his book, and he's right, here's all, how all this has played out, this is why we're still doing these issues. Mm. So yeah, a lot of it is the perennial stuff. There are new issues, obviously, but some of them are just not going to go away. We'll be right back with our guest, Sue Kelly, President and CEO of APPA. We're back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. We're discussing the influence that the autobiography of APPA's longtime CEO, Alex Radin, has had on Sue Kelly. Just what stood out for me was how, and I'm not sure how to put this, so I guess I'll just put it inartfully, is that public power is almost theological. I mean, it's not just a business for us because it is not for profit, but this whole idea of community ownership, the idea of being there to serve the community is really, it's almost theological. It was forged in the fire of the time of Alex when, I mean, investor-owned utilities really did try to take us out and the rural electric co-ops too. Just didn't like the competition, didn't like TVA. It was a socialist institution, needed to be taken out. We went through a lot of that where we'd had to fight for our right to exist. That has left us with a kind of strong view that we have a role to play here. We are, in effect, you know, FDR called us the yardstick. How public power is the yardstick that's in the closet. If investor-owned utilities are getting too greedy, Let me once again provide a little historical context. Sue is referring to a campaign speech that Franklin Delano Roosevelt made in Portland, Oregon on September 21st, 1932. At issue was the power wielded by the public utility trusts, of which Samuel Ensel was the poster child. As governor of New York prior to his election to president in 1932, Roosevelt had had firsthand experience with the power of these utility trusts. I unfortunately couldn't find audio of the speech as is customary at the Lyceum. Instead, I've attached a link to the full text of the speech from the archives in FDR's presidential library. In the speech, FDR demonstrates his masterful ability to speak to the people in persuasively concrete, clear language in which he builds his argument in digestible steps. He goes back to the reign of King James to explain the common law definition and principles of a public utility through cases concerning the ferry boat operators for crossing rivers and streams in England. He describes the abuses that had taken place between corporations and their regulators during his own experience. He did not hold with those who advocated government ownership of all utilities. He felt it was a proper function for private capital and private initiative. He did feel that in cases where a community is not satisfied with the services rendered or rates charged by a private utility, It has the undeniable right after fair referendum to set up its own governmentally owned and operated service. He said that this would not apply when a community is being served to its satisfaction by a private company, but the very fact that a community can, by a vote of the electorate, create a yardstick, not the kind for measuring, but the kind commonly used in corporal punishment in that bygone age, that the community can create a yardstick of its own which guarantees good service and low rates to its population. He went further to clarify and called the right of the people to own the utility a birch rod in the cupboard to be taken down and used only when the child gets beyond the point where a mere scolding or admonishment doesn't do any good. If communities have the right to form their own public power utilities, that that will in effect act as a check on the investor-owned community. We've kind of always had that role of the conscience of the industry. People who work in public power kind of feel like it's a calling. And And why did Alex, why was it a calling for him? He grew up in Chattanooga and he saw what TVA did for the Valley (coughs) firsthand, came to Washington during the war and just started working at APPA when it was like a two-person 
organization and just kind of brought it up and helped make it what it was when he left, which was a very vital advocacy organization. But, you know, he was a TVA boy. We'll be right back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. We're back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. Over the last four years for you, what's been some of the most story-worthy moments of your leadership and your experience? Well, which ones can I tell? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's a couple things. I don't want to lead with being the first woman, but that's one of the things that comes to me, Mm -hmm. which is, It's been very interesting to see how many women who work at public power utilities really care about the fact I have this job and what it has inspired them to do. If I can get a chance to speak to the woman's interest group at a particular utility, or if I can take the opportunity to go speak to a woman's group, for example, I did one a year or two ago at the Midcon and Independent System Operators. I spoke to their woman's interest group. I've spoken to Seattle City Lights, Omaha power districts, it's clear to me that there is a thirst for role models. This person has done it, so I can do it too. And I think it's laid a bit of a heavy responsibility on me Mm -hmm. to show that it can be done and done well, to be basically a model for other people to say, yes, if I want to go that far, I can. So I feel that very heavily. What's your message, Sue, when you're speaking in front of these groups? What do you want to leave the group with? I've developed a talk. That's my TED talk about this. And a talk about certain things I've learned that I would like them to know so that they don't have to go through it the hard and painful way like I did. It includes things like you don't have to be perfect. You just have to do your best, which sounds a little what's the word, like, you know, something you'd find printed on an embroidery sampler or something. But the fact of the matter is a lot of women, especially of my generation, felt like they had to be completely perfect. They had to be the perfect homemaker. They had to also be the perfect employer. They had to, you know, I spent all these years just trying to be a lawyer in private practice, a partner in my firm, also be a step parent and a parent. And trying to do all that, I mean, I really beat myself senseless. When looking back on that, I realized, You know, I was doing pretty, your best is generally good enough. So don't berate yourself for not being able to be everything to everybody. You just can't beat yourself about that. Mm -hmm. If you do your best, that's generally good enough. So that was one of the messages that that you you share is that the- Um, the There were two others that kind of go together. One is nobody goes away. What does that mean? Over the course of my time in Washington, I started as an energy lawyer in 1980. By this point, I know people who have been through three or four different jobs, who started out over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and are now general counsel at this place, or they've become the senior VP for policy at that. I know their lineage. It's like rock bands. First, Eric Clapton was in Derek and the Dominoes, and then he went to Cream and, you know, all that kind of thing, or vice versa. But the point is, is that you know all these people through three or four different career kind of paths. The people who might be on the other side of you from litigation one day may wake up as your client the next day. Because of that, because nobody goes away, you cannot be a jerk. If you were a jerk to that person when you were in an adversarial role with them and all of a sudden they're your firm's client, you're going to live to regret that. So it's better to have been professional in all your dealings with people because that way, When that happens, you don't have to think back and say, oh, gosh, that's the person I said X, Y, Z to, and how unfortunate that was in retrospect. To me, it's really important that you don't be a jerk because nobody goes away. You shouldn't be a jerk just because you shouldn't be a jerk. But, you know, if you need an ulterior motive to not be a jerk, that's it. Nobody goes away. It's very hard to see that in your early career. That, right. That... You don't know that till later. So that's why I feel like that's an important piece of career advice mm-hmm. to hand on. Mm-hmm. Let's take another break. We'll be right back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA.
We're back with Sue Kelly, president and CEO of APPA. Shifting gears a little bit into technology's role. We talked about what's old is new, but there's some things that are new, new, but maybe the application of it is directed towards an older need or a long-standing need. You're an information source. You're an insight provider to your membership. How have you seen technology enable some of your work? The blog. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought that anybody would have cared what I think. But that is a great way to communicate with members. Yeah, it's excellent, by the way. Have you been doing that for two years now? A little I less? think I was convinced to do it soon after I became the CEO. Oh, yeah. Her communications team persuaded her. They just said, you should do this. And I'm like, why? But it was really brought home to me that it mattered. A couple of years ago, I was at our line workers rodeo. And I was just walking down the hallway of the hotel and these two 20-something guys, line workers, came up to me and said, are you Miss Kelly? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And they said, well, we really like your blog. And I'm like, wow. You know, that just kind of brought home the power of it to me, that it's a way to communicate with all sorts of people in our public power community, people who I would not even thought would have cared to read what I write. There's a lot of people that do. Well, you have a very nice tone in your blog, and it's very easy to read. It becomes part travel log, part what's on your mind, the experiences that you're having, and then certainly it has its advantages for you to talk about issues as well, but right. you so draw some, a nice balance across. Some of them are about issues. For example, you know, the PMAs. PMAs are power marketing administrations. I wrote, saddle up and ride again. Here we are, you know, this gets back to Alex Ray, and you know, for the 15th <laughs> time, we have to oppose the sale of the PMAs. Some of it is travel log because I feel like it's important for our members to know about our other members. What strikes me as I go around the country is how different our members are. There's certain core values that are the same, which is service to the community and giving back to it and reflecting its values. But that's very different from California to North Dakota. It's just, it's give a, different. Give a difference. Well, it's, they talk about how all politics is local. Uh, I was in Nebraska a couple years ago at the Joint Action Agency. They were giving their Project of the Year award, and it was to a solar array from Central City, Nebraska. It was one of those things where there was a large developer in town who wanted to do a solar project and got together with the city manager and the utility director, and they just decided they'll do that. They'll do a community solar array. That's what I love about it, is that they can react to what's going on in the community and what people there want to do mm -hmm. and kind of take that and run with it. That's, you know, you don't think of Nebraska as that hotbed of community solar power, but that's what they were doing. Then you go to California. For example, one of the things when I went to NCPA, the Northern California Power Agency, they were doing a fundraiser at their 50th anniversary celebration for victims of the CAR fire. That's C-A-R-R. -R. There was a horrible wildfire mm -hmm. in Northern California. Yes. Yes. They were raising money at their that's anniversary nice. celebration for victims of the fire. Okay. That's just another example of giving back to their community and how they, what they see their role as. It's interesting to see what motivates our members around the country. And the pride that comes with it. Nebraska, they build this solar project, but there's the byproduct community pride that comes with it. There is a lot of that. There is a system in Minnesota where they have done a capture the sun and a capture the wind project so that you can buy into their solar array and take a portion of the wind from their wind turbine that's right there in town. It's local, you can see it. And we have a lot of members that are doing those community solar arrays because it's just, it's a source of pride. It's a way to show the community that you are sharing their values. It also gives people who couldn't necessarily do solar in their own house, maybe the roof faces the wrong way, maybe they're renters or whatever, gives them an opportunity to participate if that's what their values are. I think it's, we've got a lot of members that have done that. It's a success. Well, with Nebraska, then you become the group that can showcase them to other communities across the country can see that through you. Well, and I actually blogged about it. <laughs> that was, that's one way I try to do that, is to say, hey, this, I was up here and they're doing this. Just to try and share what I learn when I go around to the various meetings of public power entities. I, I learn as much as I 
give them mm -hmm. when I go. It helps me to understand what our members in different parts of the country are facing and what they're doing. This was all in light of technology's role and your work and the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity risk as the dark side of technology. Yeah. What can you talk about in this dark side context? We have been lucky enough to be the recipient of what's known as a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy. It's a three-year agreement, and it authorizes a total of up to $7.5 million over three years for us to help our members, especially our smaller members, improve their cybersecurity posture. We have done a lot with that money. We picked 10 members and had consultants go out there and test their cyber system and assess their posture, just so we can get a baseline of what are different utilities doing, where are they on their cybersecurity journey. We've done a lot of training and workshops around the country, doing tabletop exercises to get people thinking about, if this were to happen to me, how would I react? What would I do? We've developed a tool called the Cybersecurity Scorecard. You may have heard of the C2M2, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model. Well, the Department of Energy developed this model for our industry. In effect, it's an assessment tool that utilities can administer to themselves to find out where they need to improve their cybersecurity procedures and practices. But it's a humongous tool, and it takes, it's like, I don't know, 500 questions? I mean, it's big. For a small municipal utility, probably too big. So what we did was we hired a consultant to, in effect, develop the small utility version of that, and it's called the Cybersecurity Scorecard. So that's on our website. Our members can go and answer 14, 15 questions in about 45 minutes to an hour, and then get a scorecard and a set of recommendations about what steps they might want to take mm -hmm. to improve their cybersecurity posture. It's an assessment tool. We have been out there, we've developed this tool, now we're trying to implement it, get as many members as possible to take it. As I go out to meetings, I've been talking about the scorecard, and I actually spent a recent member meeting, they, they often have what they call an expo, where they have booths with different vendors, and our scorecard vendor was there, so I stayed at that booth, you know, kind of played Vanna White to bring people over to the booth to get them to kind of experience what the scorecard would be and nice. convince them to take it. We are really working hard to try and get our members to think about these issues and take action to improve their posture. Let's take a final break. We'll be right back with Sue Kelly, President and CEO of APPA. I was struck in your last blog about your travel, I think, urgently from Buffalo to get back down this way to deal with the uninvited guest named Florence that you were dealing with. The whole concept of mutual assistance and mutual aid, talk about that within the APPA. Well, course. it's one more manifestation of joint action in okay. that we obviously know utility can maintain on their own staff enough line workers and supervisory personnel to bring themselves back up after a catastrophic event. So of course you have to depend on your neighbors. So it's the electric utility kind of manifestation of the golden rule that do unto others as you would have them do unto you. APPA operates a mutual aid network. We're kind of the tip of the spear for a national event. We have a whole series of network coordinators from different parts of the country, states, regions, specific utilities who take on the mutual aid coordination function for their area. And this is within the public power arena, or yes, is it, it's, it, okay? It, now, investor-owned utilities have their own set of mutual aid institutions, they're called RMAGs, Regional Mutual Assistance Groups. We have our mutual aid network. The co-ops is, are more decentralized. I think they're operated at the state basis. But so what we have is a mutual aid network. We have a playbook. We exercise every year. I think we're going to be exercising later in October in Los Angeles to go over lessons learned from this hurricane season and to do an exercise to help us improve our procedures. 
But what we do is when we're activated because we think there's going to be a regional event that requires more than just one state or one region, we will activate and we will do a battle rhythm of calls every day. And we act as a clearinghouse for resources that people can offer. I can offer this many crews, this many trucks. For example, in Florence, one of the big needs was equipment that could operate in water logged areas. We were working on trying to locate that specialized equipment mm. because a lot of people, a lot of, were trying to restore service in areas that had been flooded. Well, number one, you can't go back in until the floodwaters go down. And you, you don't want to put more people at risk. But once you do, the conditions are such that you often need specialized equipment to be able to restore service. So we were working on helping get that as well. So you do a battle rhythm of calls. You put people together, help say, you know, this crew will go to this area and try and figure out what's needed in terms of equipment and materiel. To work with our government partners is another very important component of that. For example, you need waivers of tolls. If you're on what, toll what roads, oh, oh, you know, if you're sending all, roads. yeah, uh, really, you uh, know, you're, you're trying to make sure that they don't have to pay tolls for all these line workers to head down in their trucks. Also, that there's enough fuel, that there's lodging, you know, all those kinds of things. So we work with our government partners to try and identify problems or barriers and work to eliminate those. Florence actually turned out to be a more kind of isolated event than originally anticipated, but it turned into a flooding event as much as a hurricane event. That went on for quite some time because it was very slow moving. A lot of rain fell over North and South Carolina, even up into the mountains, but all that water then went back down to the coast. So there was a prolonged event for certain municipalities. And one of them, I think you probably saw the city of New Bern was in North Carolina, yes. it was all over the news, that's one of our members. Okay. So we had a lot of members who were impacted mm -hmm. by this. Uh, but that's, we activate when those things occur. One of the things I was concerned about why I left my meeting early and came back was at that point, it looked like the hurricane may be coming over this area. Right. And that there might be flooding. And as you, you know, we are susceptible to flooding. Yes. So we were concerned that we might have to exercise our own business continuity plan at the same time and help coordinate this remotely instead of from our offices. As it turned out, we did not have to do that, but I just wanted to make sure I was back on site in case we had to do any of that kind of work. It's amazing the complexity of all this and of running an association at so many different levels. There's complexity in these areas of advocacy, policy, information source, insight provider. To me, every day is a new challenge. There's always something, some kind of policy differences that need to be reconciled or ironed out. There's always challenges, obviously, in the legislature and in the regulatory agencies. There's always new technology to talk to our members about. It's the old Saturday night expression, ain't one thing, it's another. There's a lot of that. It's a very fulfilling and exciting job because there's a lot to deal with and you find yourself stretched in ways that you never really thought you would be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue, for having me in. Oh. This has been a great discussion. No, it's my pleasure. We hope you found this episode 18 on Leadership of Associations featuring Sue Kelly, President and CEO of APPA, informative and educational. Keep your eyes out in December for episode 19. Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum LLC, copyright 2018, all rights reserved. Come back and see us. It's lonely at the top. Of the